Hello, everyone. So I want to talk to you guys some more about the Roman Jewish Wars. Uh, recently, I uh, got started reading uh, Josephus, and I have been reading Josephus's uh, a book on the Roman Jewish conflict for these last couple of months now. It is a very, very fascinating read, and I <laughs> it's kind of a long read, uh, but I have been enduring. Uh, I'm one of those guys who likes to read the book from beginning to end. I feel like I have to or else I am missing out. Uh, a lot of people, even a lot of academics, you know, they will read sections of the book or they will look at the index in the back of the book, look up the terms that they're interested in and just read the parts of the book that pertain to those topics. And then they'll say, okay, I got what I wanted out of it. But I feel like if I don't read the book in its entirety, I am missing out because books can be very, very rich. And even if you read a really boring book, uh, you may find some gems in between all of that mundane literature, all of that boring, tedious reading. You may find some jewels of knowledge, and those can be game-changing. Those can really change your perspective on whatever it is that you're reading on. Uh, so I'm reading uh, Josephus's book on the Roman Jewish conflict, and I just recently got done with the part when Josephus recounts on the uh, siege of Gischala. Now, Gischala was a very well-fortified Jewish town, uh, and that is the, the Latin way of referring to the town. The Hebrew um, name of the town is Gush Halav. It was a very well-fortified town. The Jews had built some pretty heavy walls to protect the town against uh, the Roman siege. Uh, and the Jews were actually very confident that they were going to win the battle over Gischala because they had put so much faith on their fortifications. Uh, when the Romans first attacked the town, the Romans actually lost and they had to retreat. The reason because, well, the Romans, once they got past the stones, which the Jews were slinging at them, and at this point, this was like an ancient version of the Battle of Normandy Beach, and once the Romans got through the walls and they got into the town, the Jewish fighters had actually fled all the way to the highest point of the town. And the Romans thought, okay, the Jews are scared, let's go finish them off. Uh, what they didn't know was that they were being trapped, and when the Romans ran all the way up to the highest point of this town, they were uh, cornered, and a lot of Roman soldiers were slaughtered, and the rest of them had to run away, including Vespasian himself, the general Vespasian himself. The Romans uh, had to rethink their strategy. They returned to the town, and they defeated the Jews. And they took over Gischala. When the Romans defeated the Jews in the battle over Gischala, a lot of the Jewish fighters fled with their uh, with their women and children out of the town, and they headed towards Jerusalem, where they took refuge there, and where they began to prepare for a battle with the Romans, because they knew that the Romans would have to take over Jerusalem, because it was the head of the of Judea, it was the capital of Judea. And so they knew that they were going to have to take over this, uh, this town. Um, but something happened after the Battle of Gischala that's really remarkable, and that is there was virtual lawlessness throughout Judea. It was insane. Um, Josephus talks about how there was a revolt of the poor. There was a revolt of the masses towards the wealthy Jews. And he talks about how there were these mobs of Jews who went out and they picked up uh, the prestigious citizens of Judea and they slit their throats. And they, at first they put them in a jail cell, they put them in a prison, and then they had their throats slit. This was French Revolution style revolution, French Revolution style vigilante violence. Um, and they had this idea of, well, we're going to kill off all these rich people in Judea. And they began to steal property. They began to loot homes. Uh, this was like the Bolshevik Revolution, circa 70 AD, if you will. The spirit of Lenin was alive and well, even in Judea in far antiquity. And it was there, lingering about. That demonic spirit possessed the souls of the Jews 
at that time. And there was a leading rabbi that Josephus talks a lot about. His name was Ananias. That is basically a Latin rendition of Anani. Anani is a very common name um, in ancient Judea, and, and it's even common amongst Lebanese Jews today. And Rabbi Ananias proclaimed in the city of Jerusalem to the Jews, telling them, you have become worse than the Romans, for at least the Romans have rules. At least the Romans have limits. You guys have no rules. You have no limits. You're slaughtering each other. You're robbing each other. You're murdering each other. And for what? Whatever happened to fighting for liberty? Whatever happened to liberating ourselves from Roman occupation? That has gone out the window. And he made this argument, and it really reminded me as I was reading this stuff, it really reminded me of several things. For one, it, re it reminded me of the rise of joker politics that we're, we are seeing today. We could call this communism, but I, I would say it's more so of a mixed bag because you have the rise of different fringe and radical ideologies today. You have the anarcho-communist, anarcho-capitalist, basically Nazis, the rise of popular right-wing eugenics, the rise of populism, the rise of open communism, the rise of democratic socialism in the United States. This is all about revolting against the establishment. And if you look into the Roman Jewish conflict, it's very interesting. There was this radical movement that was against the establishment. It wasn't just against the Roman government. You see, this is the conventional view that a lot of people have when they're talking about, or when they're, or when they're discussing the Roman-Jewish conflict. They think, well, you know, Romans you know, were occupying Judea. Jews didn't like that. They wanted to revolt to make a Jewish state. They had a revolution. Jews lost. Then there was the diaspora, and the Jews were kicked out. That is like the... History Channel reenactment version. You know, they show the Jew who looks like Zola Levitt, and he's got a big beard, and he got the, the house that looks like something out of the Scorpion King, and some guy has a scimitar in his hand, and then he got the Roman soldier with the shield and the feather on his helmet, and they're like, ah! And, like, and then they have that annoying, obnoxious narrator who's like, the Jews were tired of Roman occupation. They decided to fight. And they have, like, some guy who looks like a folk singer from memphis tennessee he's got a big beard and thick glasses and he's like well you know the jews just had enough of roman tyranny and they just decided to break out <sighs> and they got the reenactment and then of course they have the viagra commercial that comes after that gotta pay the bills for this television show uh so anyway yeah this is like the most Walmart version of history that I've ever heard. It's kind of like the people who say, you know, uh, oh yeah, there was a Maccabean revolt, and then the Seleucids destroyed the temple, and then they had a menorah, and that's how Hanukkah came. It's like, this is the Rugrats version of the Bible. This is the Rugrats version of history. Let's kind of get beyond that. This is why I'm totally for reading firsthand accounts. Um, I think that modern day books are helpful as as an accompaniment, like they they give you a, a an easier narration to understand. They give you a lot of dates because modern day history books put a lot of emphasis on dates. So you get your dates, and you get um, uh, you get more of an easier timeline for your mind to digest. But when you're reading a first hand account like Josephus, you're getting all the you're getting all of the nitty gritty detail of it all, and that is what's really helpful. That's what's that's way more helpful than just watching a documentary. And that's way more helpful than just reading some modern-day book that you picked up off of uh, Target. Well, they don't really sell that stuff in Target, so I'm just kidding. Um, when, you read, when you read a first-hand account, you're getting all the names and the massacres and the bloody, gory stuff, and you're getting all the weird ideological um, uh, uh, factions that popped up. And it wasn't just a revolt against the Romans. It was also a revolt against the Jewish establishment that was nice with Rome, that was diplomatic with Rome, and they didn't like that. And it's kind of like today where you have these political radical factions popping up in Europe, and they're saying, we don't like these politicians who are loyal to the faceless bureaucrats in Brussels. We don't like these political parties that are loyal to the European Union, the EU establishment. We have to do a revolution. This is Joker politics. It's a revolt against the status quo, a revolt against the, the establishment, the revolt against 
the, the against convention, really. Um, and this is what was taking place in ancient Judea. Different political factions, they, were, they hated the rich Jews, they hated the Jews who were in favor of Rome, they hated the Jews who were laid back and said, hey, I don't want to fight in some war against Rome. And they had a cultural, political revolution and it was very, very violent, and it was extremely bloody. And um, you see this, and, you, and you're seeing this sort of spirit today. For example, when they talk about, you know, how we need police reform, we need police, because the police are bad, the wealthy are bad. It's this evil 1% of the world, they control all the world's wealth, they're bad. And the, you, you always have to ask the question, okay, fine, you know, 1% of the world owns all the wealth or whatever, what are you gonna do? Are you gonna kill these people? And then what? What are you gonna like? What are you gonna do with all the money? The money's just gonna be concentrated into some other guy's pockets or to another oligarch's pockets. It's just, it's gonna be concentrated into some other oligarchy, into another group of people, another group of elites. Because you're always gonna have elites. Um, oh, we need to just like abolish the police. Well, okay, abolish the police, and then what? What what are you gonna have? Community police. So you're gonna have community police. So let me get this straight. Um, you're going to get rid of the cops, the men the men in blue, the pigs, as you guys call them, or bastards, as you guys also call them. And then you're going to replace them with community-organized police so that people can, you know, people who have a better relationship with the community can have a, can have a much more conventional, a much more expedient and, and, and fairer and, and, and equitable time in, 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 in balancing out the, 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 the problems that the community has. And so we can also allocate the funds into social projects. Social projects, very important. Social projects to better the neighborhood. We don't need more guns. We need community gardens. We need flower gardens. Yes. And then they, they built a flower garden, and then, you know, a week later, it's covered in graffiti. So you're going to get rid of the cops. So you, can re you can replace the cops with, like, social workers and community organizers, which basically means the Black Panthers. And then you're going to replace the cops with the Black Panther Party uh, and like uh, some other, you know, people, and 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 these are areas that have lots and lots of crime. So you don't think criminals would ever get involved in that? You don't think criminals would ever like infiltrate that at all? Take advantage of the situation so that they can exploit that and then impose their power more. That sort of thing will happen if you do community policing. And it's the same thing when you talk about like. Police brutality. Okay, so you have a couple of people that get killed by cops, and then you actually study those cases and you find out, well, um, the cop was actually right, the cop was innocent. Most of the time, this is the case. You take a few of those stories and then you you twist the truth. Like, for example, stop, don't shoot, or I can't breathe. You twist the truth, and then you use that to promote anarchism or some crazy-ass ideology that you have. And then you ignore the fact that the people in these communities, they kill each other way more than cops ever kill them. And that was the argument of the rabbi Ananias in Jerusalem. He's like, you guys hate the Romans, but y'all killing each other more than the Romans have killed us. It's that spirit of revolution that ignores the truth. It ignores self-reflection. It ignores... Um, it ignores looking at the horrible conditions of your own people and then puts all the focus on the outside group. They're the problem. It's those Romans that are the problem. It's those white cops that are the problem. And those black police officers who are the problem because they're betraying their own people. Or it's those black Republicans. They're the problem. They hate other blacks. They're self-hating blacks. Or it's, you know, those, it's, it's, and you see this amongst Jewish people. Those Jews who believe in Jesus, they're not real Jews. Oh, no, 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 no. they're self-hating Jews. They're enemies. You see this sort of thing all the time. It's very, very destructive. But you see it. It's a spirit. And it's been possessing the souls of mankind for thousands of years. Anyway, that's my uh, lesson on that. Hope you guys have enjoyed this message. You guys just heard some theology. God bless. <laughs>